This is Closer to the Fire from the Voice of the Martyrs Canada, with a focus on the persecuted church around the world. I'm Greg Musselman. How do Christians respond when they're facing persecution? Sometimes leaving is permitted. Jesus said, when you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. And the goal in fleeing is to continue to advance the gospel. Then there are those who can't or won't leave in the face of incredible danger. Jesus' instructions to his disciples was to stay in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem at that time was a very dangerous place for the followers of Jesus. Of course, that is a situation for many of our brothers and sisters around the world that are trying to follow Jesus. Then there are times when it's appropriate to fight for one's legal rights. The Apostle Paul did so on several occasions, and like fleeing, fighting is permissible. Now, in Paul's case, it could be argued that he defended his legal rights in order to further the kingdom of God. And it's also worth noting that even Jesus defended himself at one point during his trial, and this was not to protest his suffering, but as a testimony to his innocence. On this edition of Closer to the Fire, we're going to be discussing the importance of advocating for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and also for the freedom of religion for people of all faiths, and why that's important. My guest is Merv Thomas, the founder and president of Christian Solidarity Worldwide. CSW teams of specialists work in over 30 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East to ensure that the right of freedom of religion or belief is upheld and protected when possible. Merv, thank you for being on Closer to the Fire. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's, uh, well, I don't know if it's a pleasure, if that's the right word to say, but it's, uh, it's a tremendous work to be involved with, and it's, uh, you know, it's God's work. And we so appreciate the partnership that we have with you at the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. You know, and that's kind of an interesting point, is that you know, we're excited to be able to talk about what God is doing around the world, but of course, there's so much suffering. And I, and again, I, I know that's the challenge of the work that we do, but it's important work, right? Absolutely. It's vital. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, and we at CSW, of course, we are, we are, we are in a slightly different ministry to, to what you're in, in that um, we are purely an advocacy organization. So we, uh, you know, our role is to be a voice for the voiceless and to speak up in in the corridors of power, speak truth to power, if you like. And uh, uh, so somebody has to do that. And mm. uh, that's the role that God's called us to do at CSW. Yeah. And I know with Voice of the Martyrs Canada, we work with a number of organizations where there is overlap. There's some things that uh, ministry like yours that uh, go beyond what Voice of the Martyrs Canada does. But there's certainly that, uh, you know, that level of uh, co cooperation because we both have important work to do. And it, you know, it's just a part of working with the persecuted church. And then, of course, yours goes beyond other yeah. religious groups as well. Now, before we talk about the important work of Christian Solidarity Worldwide, Merv, why did you start doing this work? <laughs> well, as a... Uh... I often ask myself that question. It's uh, it's been a life. So I've been doing it for forty three years now, wow. and uh, you know it's uh, it was. I was. I guess let's go back to the beginning. I I was uh, I was brought up in a Pentecostal home. Um, that's my background. And but I got involved um, in my early twenties with uh, in politics because I felt that um, you know we needed Christians in the political realm. And in those days, certainly in the UK, um, Christians, evangelical or Pentecostal Christians, certainly didn't get involved in politics. It was, it was a kind of dirty word, um, but I felt a real call into that. And I, I got involved locally. I was, I was elected local as a, as a local councillor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started doing some work a couple of evenings a week in, in Parliament. I lived fairly close to London. And, uh, and it was while I was working for an MP there, it was a Catholic MP actually, who um, he heard about uh, he heard about persecution of of Christians in Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, that was uh, in, in those days, you cast your mind back to 1979. If you can, you're probably a lot younger than me, Greg. So you uh, Slightly, might not be able to... but not much younger. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so um uh, you know, that was the only place where we heard about persecution and we heard about it um, uh, from, a, from another group who visited London and uh, David Atkinson, the MP involved, he said to me, shall we start something here in the UK? 
And, and originally we were part of another ministry called Christian Solidarity International, but um, we, we subsequently <clears throat> um, branched out on our own. And, uh, and so, yeah, that, that was how it started. And uh, to be honest with you, I, didn't, I can't say that God gave me an incredible burden for the persecuted church to start with. I was kind of doing it as a favour to my friend who was a member of parliament. And, um, but I do know that uh, even uh, at the end of that day when he asked me if I was prepared to sort of start something with him, um, I, I did feel God speak to me and, and show me that actually this organization was going to become um and we didn't use the word advocacy much in those days but right. it, the way the lord showed me was that we were going to kind of become a christian version of amnesty international if you like yeah and uh, and that i was going to be at the center of it and god clearly did show me that and uh and so uh, and it was subsequently as we began to work on cases and began to visit countries that God clearly placed a, a, a heavy and deep burden on my heart for those who are being persecuted for their faith. So that's how it all started. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, how different people get involved with, uh, you know, work with persecuted Christians. I know for me, I was a, a young pastor and, you know, I heard about the persecuted church through another great organization, Open Doors, and something kind of locked in my heart. And there's other staff members that we've had at Voice the Martyrs Canada that knew nothing about persecution, thought it was something that happened, you know, in the, in the Roman times, you know, when they put the, you know, Christians in the Colosseum and yeah. didn't realize how prevalent it was for today. Now, again, it's a hard work and, uh, you know, more than four decades you've been involved with Christian Solidarity Worldwide. What has been the most rewarding part of, of the work you've done, Murph? Um, you know, it's, uh, there's been a lot of rewarding things. There's been a lot of things that have been hard. Um, in fact, most of it's been hard. But I guess one of the rewarding things has been probably the most rewarding things is, is meeting those Christians that have suffered um, incredibly for their faith. And, uh, and just, um, I, I, I've often said, Greg, that I can't recall meeting a miserable persecuted Christian. Um, you know, I've met a lot of frightened persecuted yeah. Christians, but somehow, um, you know, there's something, there's this inner strength, there's this inner joy that they have. And, and interestingly, I took my, son we we were talking before we started this podcast i took my son to nigeria when he was 17 years old and we visited a village where um they'd had a number of attacks by the fulani militia and a number of the villagers have been killed um it was uh it was a, a horrible situation and i i um as we drove away from the village my son said to me dad he said it should be compulsory for every British Christian to come to this village. And I said, Seth, why? Why do you say that? And he said, well, because, you know, he said, um, I, they, they've, they've been, a number of them have been killed. Um, uh, the, the Fulani militia are camped around the village. They can't go into their fields to farm because right. uh, the militia are there and killing them. Uh, so they're beginning to starve. He said, but dad, I noticed when you prayed for them, there was this joy on their faces and in their hearts, he said. And, and, and he said, you go to our church in the UK and they're full of miserable people. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that was yeah. a generality. Uh, but, <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> it is a generality. I know many yeah, uh, yeah. British Christians. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they're not like that in Canada, but, but no, <laughs> it, it was, uh, I get what he was saying. And, and, you know, it's, it's, there is something about some of the people that we meet who go through the most harrowing and trying um, times, people who have been in prison, people who have been tortured. My friend Helen Bahani in, in Eritrea, who spent three and a half years in a metal shipping container. But when you meet these people, that they've got something uh, that is very, very special. And so, you know, that's certainly one of the upsides of, of doing this work. The other one is, is, you know, I think God has really taught me patience. The work that we do as an advocacy organization is not something where we see results every day. Uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say to you, nor could I say to some of my major donors who, and of course donors always want to see results, which right. is perfectly understandable. I can't say to them that last year I fed 
50,000 people or I delivered medical supplies to X number of people or I saved so many lives because it's not like that in advocacy. It's, uh, you know, our successes are, are small steps. Um, and, and when I look back over the 40 years, when I, when I started this, Greg, you know, there were a handful of members of parliament who are interested in this. Nobody, it wasn't the subject that people knew anything about or were particularly interested in. Uh, but when I look back 40 years later, you know, I see in the British Parliament, for example, there's an all party parliamentary group of MPs and, and Lords who um, of 150 people um, speaking up for freedom of religion or belief around the world, which is which is incredible. Yeah. When I look at when I look at the ministerial conferences that have been held in Washington and in London earlier this year, where we have world leaders and government um, ministers coming together to talk solely about freedom of religion or belief, that's a success. But it's taken 40 years, and we've mm. still got a long way to go. We've got this incredible awareness now at a political level, but we still haven't seen an awful lot of change. And so we need now to press on, but we press on from a uh, from a different place because now people know and understand the importance of freedom of religion or belief. Right. And I want to talk about uh, later on a little bit, because it's not just the Christians you're standing up for. It's uh, for people, Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and mm. people of other uh, faith groups. Um, but mm. biblically, you know, we think about, uh, you know, in the Bible, uh, you know, when their persecution comes and, you know, I'm working on a, another book on this and Glenn Penner, our former CEO, wrote in Shadow of the Cross about the responses of persecution. So, you know, there's times when people will flee and, and we understand that and go to another village. And I and I talked a little bit about it on the introduction of this podcast. And then you've got people that they can't leave or they in places like Afghanistan. And we've heard from believers there that they're not leaving and and you know, again, if somebody wants to leave, that's, you know, you know, God bless them and we'll help in whatever way we can, but there's those that will stay and there's those that will fight. And, and again, we talk about fighting. It's in the legal sense. Why is advocacy and fighting? And we'll, we'll talk particularly about our brothers and sisters in Christ, and then we'll broaden the discussion. But why is that so important, Murph, to do that? Well, it's, it's important because, um, you know, somebody needs to tell these stories to people in power um, unless and until they are aware uh, of two things still they are aware of um, of what is going on um, uh, and until they are aware and the of the importance of bringing about religious freedom and importance not just for people of faith but importance for everybody in countries where there is true religious freedom you know they are countries that are that are that generally respect all human rights you know it's a kind of the right to freedom of religion or belief is a kind of canary in the coal mine if you like and if that if that right is being breached then others will be too it's good for economic stability it's good for for peace and prosperity all of these things, but but somebody needs to tell the stories. And, and so one of the things that we do that is really, really important is we either will take politicians to countries to see for themselves, or we'll bring people out of the countries mm -hmm. to speak into our into Parliament at the United Nations, where CSW has status on Capitol Hill. And, you know, I, 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 when I go back in, in 1985, I took three American congressmen to Romania and Romania was a country in those days, very similar to North Korea today in many respects, except it didn't have nuclear weapons. Um, I took three congressmen there and uh, for all of us, it was my first trip to a country of persecution. It was theirs. And to all of us, that was life changing. And so and if I tell you the names of one of those congressmen was Congressman Frank Wolf and anybody mm. involved in um, in the persecuted church and in religious freedom will know the name of Frank Wolf because Frank yeah. um, went on to author the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act in, in, in America, um, which uh, which. 
uh, gave rise to the uh, to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, the State Department Office of International Religious Freedom, and the um, and also the Ambassador at Large for International Religious oh. Freedom. That, uh, but that was birthed out of going to the country, seeing for ourselves, and coming back and saying, "Well, you know, we're not involved in aid, but we can provide you with a voice. We can provide you um, with a, with a, a means of 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 making." people aware of what is going on and when i say people i don't mean people in churches that's another part of our job but i mean people in power who can make a difference and so it's absolutely vital and i, I remember actually uh, on that same visit to nigeria with my son i remember saying to the people there look i can't our organization uh, doesn't deliver aid we don't get involved in any of these things but you know we can come back and and we were able to work with voice of the martyrs canada on some of this mm -hmm. stuff but but you know what i can promise you is this that your story will be heard at the united nations your story will be heard on capitol hill your story will be heard in westminster and you know it gives hope to people it gives people you know a, a kind of lifeline they can think yes somebody's going to hear about this because so often when we go to those places the first thing we hear, hear is we thought the world had forgotten about right, us yes very sadly we often hear greg we I, we thought the church had forgotten about us and which is even sadder so so you know that's why it's so important that we tell these stories that we inspire people because but particularly christian um, politician, sorry, non-Christian politicians don't always get the importance of, of, of religious freedom because particularly in the West, in Western Europe and, and maybe in Canada and, and America too, you know, we're a much more secular country than we used to. And people don't understand that the majority of the world are religious, mm -hmm. um, whether that's yeah. Christians, whether it's Muslims, or the majority of the world are, world are deeply religious. And so uh, we, I remember our foreign secretary, I sit on our foreign secretary's human rights advisory group here in the UK. And I remember um, him, uh, we brought some, uh, some uh, Christians from, from Iraq and Pakistan and Eritrea and, and, uh, he was questioning them and couldn't quite understand, couldn't quite get his head around, well, why wouldn't you convert when you were asked to do it? Didn't really understand the deep faith and belief that people had. And, and until they understand that, until they see these people and hear the stories firsthand, they, they don't really recognize how important religious freedom is. Yeah, it is, it is so important. And that is good for Christians as well than when in countries where especially they're in the minority and in some countries like as you mentioned Pakistan like two percent so they need the protection let's just uh, go back a little bit then from in, from we'll just speak to the church at this point uh, from a theological perspective why is it important and I use the word fight before we can use legal defense advocacy uh, but the understanding is that we need to stand up for our brothers and sisters in Christ why is that so important and why do you have that conviction Murph well it's well first of all you know let me say at, at CSW we um we actually are not a mission organization okay right. so let's, let's, yeah. we, we actually have got and it's important that we have this we have got a a, a non um proselytization or evangelistic po evangelism policy right that right. means that there's an organization we don't we don't get involved in in the preaching of the gospel however we recognize that as individuals we are a christian organization we recognize that as individuals we have we 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 have to do that uh, but but not as an organization but to me the gospel of jesus christ is the answer to every problem that there is in the world you know that the problem the answer is jesus christ and that's what i believe as a christian and so uh, i want to see even though as an organization we don't evangelize, I want to see the conditions right so that anybody um, in the world can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I also need to recognize that everybody else, God gave everybody a free will. And so, you know, that right has to be for all people. But I do it for Christians because they're my family. Uh, but, 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 um, but I just, 
and, and I'll probably come on to this in a minute, but I, I, I just have got this deep conviction that I haven't just got to speak up for Christians mm. um, because the way to actually um, make the gospel freely available and lived and, and article 18 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which is the, the article that we work with in, in, in the Parliament and the UN, it gives everybody the right to choose their religion, to change their religion and to practice their religion. Right. You know, we're not talking about freedom of worship here, freedom to worship inside a church building or inside a home. We're talking about the freedom to practice our religion out in the world, out in the community. And so that's really important for, for Christians to be able to have that right. Uh, but but if we want to protect Christians, if we want to speak up for them, we also have to recognize that that is a right that should be had by all. Right. And, I, and it is something that's so important. And I know that, uh, you know, other organizations we work with, China Aid with Bob Fu, and you're familiar, of course, with Bob and the work that they do. Yeah. And again, there's crossover that we have with, uh, with Bob and the Voice of the Martyrs, as we do with CSW. I've had the privilege of meeting, you know, one of your leaders, uh, Yanusa Madu down in Nigeria, doing a great work for Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Again, there's those crossovers that we have and that we need to work together. And, uh, yeah. you know, your strength and, uh, you know, Bob Fu in terms of advocacy is something that we just absolutely so appreciate. And that's a part of uh, defending our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, Merv, in over the years, the 40 plus years you have worked at CSW now and an, or again, an organization that you founded, how have things changed since you started? Well, as I've already said, politically, things have changed a lot um, in that now there is this incredible awareness of what's going on in the world. But I have to say, and you know, uh, I've been doing it for 43 years on our 40th anniversary. I was asked that very same question that you've just asked me on a, on a radio interview. And it made me think actually there isn't <laughs> sadly uh, on the ground, there isn't an awful lot of change. If, if anything, things are worse than they've ever been yeah. apart from of course, you know, the countries that we first worked on in Eastern Europe um, are largely free today, which they, I say largely, but some of them are stepping backwards. Yeah. But, um, but nevertheless, um, you know, but, but, but the situation for religious freedom and persecution of Christians and others is probably uh, as bad as it's ever been. Yeah. Although that's always difficult to gauge, Greg, because, you know, we now live in a much more um, global world than we ever did before because of the internet and because of the immediate uh, availability and because of cameras and pictures and all kinds of technology so it's a job to to actually say whether it's worse or not but i my feeling is it's probably worse but what what i'm encouraged about is that we are now because of the widespread awareness uh, and there's now something called the International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance, which is 40 countries working at government level, which I sit on the on the Council of Experts for. And they meet monthly to talk about not just what's going on, but how countries mm. can make begin to make a difference. And of course, much of that starts in education. Right. You know, if yep. we want to see if we want to see um, Muslims treating uh, Christians well in Pakistan. If we want to see Hindus treating Christians and Muslims well in India, um, we need to start off by educating young children that actually the person sitting next to them in class or the person living next to them or down the road or in the next village is, is, is as valuable and as important as they are. And so there are many, many things where I believe we're in a much better position to push forward to actually see change. That I, but, but, you know, we have to be patient because this mm. takes a long while. Yeah, that's one of the things that uh, we do have to have is patience because things kind of move slowly and we have to measure those victories. Sometimes they're just little victories, but we have to celebrate them uh, because they're important. That's what gives us the encouragement to continue on. So what are some of the biggest challenges, uh, you know, facing CSW in your work today? The challenges are, um, are, are, are just to continue um, to get people to understand the importance of religion, particularly in the in the West. As I said earlier, there's this kind of secularism has taken hold and people think that just because we living in the West 
are not particularly religious. The rest of the world isn't religious. You know, some people would say 80% of the world are deeply religious. It, there's this, there's this um, um, work that needs to be done to educate. I talked about education of children, but we need to educate our politicians and those in authority that religion is important to people so we need to this there's this religious literacy education that needs to be done so that people understand that's the biggest challenge to me to get politicians not just to be aware but to realize how important this is to many people you know religion impacts the way we we think it impacts mm -hmm. the way we eat the way who we marry the kind of jobs we do the kind of investments we have all of those kind of things are impacted by religion so one of the biggest challenges is this what i would call religious illiteracy amongst amongst people who matter who can make a difference in the world that's a huge challenge yeah and and i guess it will continue to be a challenge but again we keep moving it forward those even those little increments of uh, the victories that we get so when you look at some of the countries around the world, what are some of the more, most challenging countries that you're currently working in, Murph? Well, I could be here all day on this one, yeah. but the, the, the most challenging, I, I, I would name probably four, maybe five even immediately. I mean, China and, or China and North Korea have to be, and, and they're slightly different. North Korea is probably the toughest challenge because, you know, you've got a leader there who doesn't really care what the rest of the world thinks. Um, so it's always difficult when you've got those in authority that don't respond to uh, to, to uh, being challenged on their human rights. China is very similar. Uh, the difference with China is, uh, and, and you've got to remember, you know, apart from the incredible situation for the church, the terrible situation for the church in China, you've got, you know, up to three million Uyghurs who are in right. education camps in China. Um, who are mostly uh, Muslim, by the way. Yeah, yeah, mostly Muslim. And, and uh, but, but, you know, the problem there is that most of the rest of the world want to trade with China. Hmm. So, they, so they hold back very often from criticising China on their human rights record. You've then, got, you've then got India, which has the worst, according to Pew, um, India has the worst, is the worst country in the world for societal violence against religious minorities, and uh, and that's an incredible challenge because once again, so much of so many countries in the world want to trade with with India, and and uh, Prime Minister Modi has got an amazing PR machine that tells the world things are so good in India, but they really aren't if you're a religious mm -hmm. minority. So India is a big challenge. Eritrea is another big challenge because. Um, you know, again, this is a country that doesn't respond uh, to people questioning their human rights. And uh, and it's not a country that the rest of the world wants to trade with. Uh, but they don't really care about that. So that's a serious challenge. Nigeria is is one that greatly concerns me. Nigeria is slipping into being a failed state. In fact, there are some people in Nigeria that would say it already is a failed state. The violence in the north, the violence in the central belt is horrific. And, uh, and, and Christians, and it is a religious, fu religiously fueled violence. Um, and, and getting our British government and the, and the US government too, and probably your government in Canada there too as well, getting them to recognise that this is fueled by religion right. um, uh, is, is difficult to do. <clears throat> and so that's a huge problem. Nigeria could slip in, could be the next Rwanda as far as I'm concerned, very, very serious. And the last country that I would mention um, that, that not many organizations do talk about but is the country of cuba um which is an old style communist government uh where they are you know anybody uh, any christian leader in particular that speaks out against um the country's human rights record will find themselves in serious trouble and and very often imprisoned and a very very difficult country in cuba again it's very difficult to get whenever we folk in cuba in our in our publications i always get letters from supporters who say well cuba's great i've just been on holiday there and i've been to a good church and everything's fine it isn't and uh, no. that's part of the problem is we have to overcome people's preconceptions about countries
Yeah, I mean, all those countries except Cuba, Voice of the Martyrs works in pretty diligently. We we have had uh, work in Cuba. I know that Open Doors Canada and other open, open Doors organizations are working in Cuba. And it's one that, again, that we need to keep our eye on. Uh, I've been in the rest of those countries and have seen, uh, you know, the difficulty of persecution. I have friends actually now living in Canada that are from Eritrea. Um, and, you know, to, to meet them and to hear their stories, it's uh, it's shocking. And all that they've had to, you know, deal with. And of course, as I mentioned, our friend Yunusa Madu in Nigeria. I don't know how the leaders there deal with so much trauma. And I know that Yunus is constantly getting phone calls from people that, uh, you know, that he's working with. They've lost loved ones. They've had their children kidnapped. I mean, it goes on and on. And again, this this work can uh, really put us under, Merv, if we don't have this eternal perspective of what God yeah you know, loves the persecuted and has a, a special place in his heart for them, you know, and it precious is his sight of the death of the saints, but, but it's the reality that's the human cost that is there. But I know also in many of these countries you mentioned, there's amazing things that God is doing. You know, we think of the growth of in China of the church. Uh, and, and I've talked to, you know, Eritrean believers, even though they can't meet publicly, many are coming to Jesus. Does that also, you know, just keep you going and and not giving up the battle because God is working in so many powerful ways in, in the nations you've mentioned, including North Korea? Yeah, absolutely. Of course it does. And, and you know, and, and you, you sometimes have to look at um, the fact that uh, some of the countries with the greatest persecution are, are the places where the church is growing the fastest. And you mentioned China, but Iran, they tell me, mm. is the fastest growing church in the world where, where Christians are, you know, this is, a, this is a, a, an Islamic theocracy, uh, but the church is growing. So, yes, of course, that's really encouraging. And, of course, you know, you have to remember that because we are a Christian organisation, and, and you are too, obviously, prayer is is a huge part of the work that we do right. prayer is so important i believe that prayer changes things i believe that the reason um when we first started this we, we, in eastern europe uh, part of the reason that communism fell throughout eastern europe i believe was because um christians were praying for so many years for what was going on there so we do see breakthroughs in prayer so so yeah of course that the, the, the um, those kind of things are really, really important encouragements to us in the work that we do. And that's a good reminder not to give up on prayer if we don't see sort of that instant, re you know, God answers it instantly. I mean, he hears our prayers, but again, we don't, there's some things we just don't understand about, about the way that our father works in terms of prayer, but we keep on going, especially in our instant society, things, you know, on our phones and <laughs> restaurants, everything has to be instant. And if it's not, uh, but, you know, we have to endure as, as we pray. Just a couple of more things I want to talk to you about, Merv, here. Why is, or what is the church's role when it comes to responsibility with advocacy and, and standing up for our brothers and sisters, and not only in Christ, but other religious groups as well? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. It's really important. Let me just tell you the journey that, that I've been on and CSW has been on in the respect of speaking up for people of other faiths. <clears throat> um it, when, when I started, as I say, it was all about Christian persecution in Eastern Europe. And then, of course, 10 years after we started, we had the fall of communism. And in fact, because the only information we were really getting on persecution in those days was A, about Christians and was B, in Eastern Europe. When, that, when those amazing th scenes happened in Eastern Europe and we saw government after government fall, um, we had to question, is there, you know, is our work done at CSW? Is this, mm. is this the end of, of what we do? Um, uh, but, of course, as we looked around the world, we realised there was an awful lot more persecution. Yeah. And then um, a, a few years, maybe another 10 years after that, as we were working in Burma, um, one of my staff came back and said to me, look, um, you know, we're speaking out against the Christian groups in Burma, uh, for, oh, sorry, we're speaking for the Christian mm. groups in Burma, the Chin and the Kachin, the, the Karen and the Kareni, but we've come across this group of Muslims, the Rohingyas, who, uh, who are just as persecuted. What should we do? You know, surely we should be speaking up for them too. And that was a, that was a huge question. You know, I'm a Christian. Why should I be speaking up for Muslims? And we had to really look at what does the word of God say about this? You know, a lot of people quote the verse Galatians 6 verse 10 that talks 
quite rightly about we are to uh, do good to all, but especially to those of the household of yeah. faith. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, but what we often do, what Christian groups often do is ignore the first part of the verse that says, do good to all. Oh, yes. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, and if you got as, as we as we search the Bible, what does the Bible say? You know, there's lots of stuff in the Old Testament about, um, you know, looking after the alien in the land, the foreigner and the alien. There's, um, you know, the, one of the verses that we use all the time in the work that we do, Proverbs um, uh, ch uh, chapter 31, that talks about speaking up for those unable to speak for themselves. It doesn't say speak up for Christians or speak up for God's covenant people. It says speak up for, for those unable to speak for themselves. And so and then, of course, Jesus tells the amazing story of the of the uh, of the Good Samaritan, which was all about, look, you know, looking out for somebody you don't actually get along with or somebody you don't necessarily agree with. And so looking at all those things in the whole, it became really apparent to me and to us as an organization uh, that we needed to give a voice to all of those people. It doesn't mean Greg, that I endorse um, uh, Islamic th uh, theology or Hindu theology or any other theology apart from Christian. Of course, it doesn't mean that. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father. Uh, but it does mean that I endorse their right to believe. Now, their, their rights given to them by Article 18 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. But more importantly, that right was given by God. Mm -hmm. He gave us all a free will to choose. We are not compelled to follow Jesus. And, and we have to recognize that as Christians, that we're all made in the image of God. We are human beings. And so where anybody is persecuted for what they believe or even for what they don't believe, we speak up for atheists who are being beheaded in places like Bangladesh. It's, it's really important that we do that as Christians. That's what inspires. When anybody asks me why we do it, I say it's because of my Christian faith. It's because it's what Jesus would do, actually. And so it's really important that we that we do that. But it's important, too, that um, Christians um recognize that advocacy is important recognize that that proverbs 31 verses that talk about um speaking up for those unable to speak for themselves it's not all about feeding the hungry it's not all about um helping the poor and and, and the needy that is part of the gospel but it's also about being a voice it's also standing up and saying hey enough that's enough it's important that as christians we speak up for the yazidi people in iraq mm -hmm. who have been largely exterminated you know genocides being committed against that many people in the world today um or some people would say it's genocide of course that's a difficult term we have to be careful with that term yeah. because it's a legal term but uh, you know places like that like the uyghur muslims in, in china we've already mentioned it's important that as christians we say hey enough is enough because that's what jesus would do jesus and god hates injustice and we as christians need to speak up for that and christians in our churches i have to say greg when i first did this i was a bit concerned about what some of my evangelical most of our supporters are probably evangelical uh, or they certainly were when we started speaking up for the rohingya um i was a bit worried about what they would think uh but you know i have to say wherever i go in churches and i speak about this people are lining up to speak to me after to say we love that. We yeah. recognise that that's really, really important. We've got to get that message out to Christians everywhere. Boy, I, I know there's people listening that are going, I, I've never thought of that, that, uh, you know, yes, we need to stand up for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's pretty obvious from Scripture. But it is, as you've pointed out, it's also very scriptural to stand up, you know, for those of other faiths. And, and as you mentioned, even atheists and some of the places that they're suffering uh, because it is the way of God. And, and I and when we really understand that, that takes some of the pressure off us. It's not us against the Muslims or us against the Hindus. We're all humans. We're all created in the image of God. We need to stand up. And the reality is, and, and I, I, I know this is not the motive, but the reality is, is when people see the kindness of believers in Christ, they are attracted to Jesus rather than seeing Christians as their enemies. And I just think it's a beautiful work. And I so appreciate, you know, what you've been sharing. The last thing I want to talk about is the vision of CSW, which is to have a world free from religious persecution where everyone can practice a religion or belief of their choice. And that is the goal. That is the vision. But many would say, Merv, that's not realistic. How do you answer that? 
Well, there are a lot of things that are not realistic in in the world, but that we should strive for. And uh, and, and you know, I I, I recognise that that you know. Well, I don't recognise, I don't say it's unrealistic. I do think that, you know, Jesus told us we can expect, <clears throat> and we can expect to suffer for him. <clears throat> you know, that's that's clear in scripture. Uh, but it doesn't mean to say that we don't speak out and, and want to see that change. Um, you know, it's 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 really important. So it's, it's I, I want to have a vision that I'm striving for. Mm -hmm. And uh, however long it takes, that's that's the ideal world. That's the world that I want to live in. That's the world I'm sure everybody would like to live in. And so, um, you know, it might not be realistic in human eyes. Um, it might not be realistic, I don't know, in, in many ways, but we still strive towards it. There are, there are things, um, you know, some people might say uh, that, that, you know, net zero, carbon emissions is unrealistic it doesn't mean to say that we don't try for it let's go for it and and you know we we might get at least a, a long way there and a long way towards what the goal is well i so appreciate uh, you know you your team at christian solidarity worldwide and by the way if you know listening or watching and you want to find out more about what mervin and his team are doing csw.org.uk uh, we so appreciate the partnership that we have uh, with Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Uh, and again, I've met some of your team members. They're just fabulous people and they're doing amazing work. And, and we do need to stand up again, not only for those who follow Jesus, but other religions and, and do what Jesus said, and that's to love people. And I so appreciate you loving people. So again, Merv, uh, a pleasure to have you on Closer to the Fire and thank you for being with me. Thanks, Greg. It's been a great pleasure to be with you. And at the Voice of the Martyrs Canada, we certainly appreciate our partnership with Merv Thomas and his team at Christian Solidarity Worldwide. And not only how they are defending and advocating for Christians around the world, but people of all faiths. And as Merv challenged us, that we as followers of Jesus need to care for anyone that is being oppressed. And I hope that uh, you learned that today. I know that reminded me and uh, it encouraged me as well that we do need to stand up for those that are being oppressed. Now, could I ask you to do me a favor? Could you write a review of this podcast and rate it and also to share with your friends? You know, our goal is to bring a greater awareness of the persecution of our friends in Christ, to pray for them and to help them in any way that we can. And if you'd like to learn more about the persecuted church and how you can help, you can go to vomcanada.com. That's vomcanada.com. And there you can sign up for our monthly newsletter and also our persecution and prayer alert, which comes out each week. And uh, we can send it to your email and you can pray. That's something that I like to do in my daily devotional is to be praying for our brothers and sisters that are suffering because they love Jesus. Again, thank you for joining us on this podcast today. And remember, the closer you are to Jesus, the closer you are to the fire.